So I want to talk to you uh, today about, I think, a quiet revolution that's happening in America. You know, we've been listening to the big boys this morning, but I like the term very well, and I, I talked to Harry about it, and we even got to talk small is beautiful. So it kind of takes after Shoemaker's book many years ago in England. But high tech, high touch, bringing the farm to the city. In 1975, the University of Arizona was selected as a representative University of Science and Technology for the development of Epcot Center. And at that time, I had a very strong feeling of the fact that we needed to somehow put people, the American public, and it ended up to be the world, in touch with, with uh, production agriculture. And I remember the the worst critics that I had in developing this were my own colleagues saying, who would ever want to see agriculture and see the agriculture of the future? Well, I got news for them. Since we opened in 1982, we've had 300 million people through that pavilion. And when we started doing that pavilion for a number of years, I haven't followed it of late, over 70% of all the letters, inquiries, and, and, and comments from people who visited Epcot Center was because of the land pavilion. And we founded people we found that people were vitally interested in seeing how crops grow, where we're going in the future, and how we're going to feed everyone on this spaceship that we live on. So I want to talk to you about farm markets uh, quickly, uh, specialty markets and supermarkets. Um, I want to first talk about the controlled environment agriculture uh, systems, which I started working on many years ago when I went to Cornell University and then developed a small industry in the state in New Jersey, then went on to the University of Arizona. I brought a big farm to uh, Arizona from, from Europe called Eurofresh Farms. They have 320 acres of glass. And it became very evident to me as I watched them over the last 15 years, they're really at the mercy of the big box stores. They're bargaining all the time how to get the prices down to the point. And it's not uncommon that in the supermarkets you will see tomatoes, uh, Harriet would say tomatoes, but anyway, uh, bringing the prices down to 68 cents a pound, which is nearly the price of, of uh, nearly the price of uh, growing the crops. And the thing is that uh, when you have to spend a million dollars just to produce or or build one acre of glass house, it really wasn't an opportunity for our young people from the University of Arizona and other land grant universities to get into the production agriculture business. And so I became very interested in farm markets, and that's what really I want to talk about. So rather than getting, you know, the big greenhouses, getting the 65 cents or, or 68 cents a pound for their product, we found that young people now are getting into the whole field of agriculture, and many of them getting into very simple high tunnel greenhouses, but making their sales directly to the consumer. And uh, I have small growers that I work with in New York, Vermont, that go down to Union Square in New York City and will sell tomatoes for upward of $12 a pound, no trouble. And so it's, there, there's an explosion of young people getting into the business. And there's this feeling about, you know, feeling good about animals. For example, let me read the sign there on the right bottom. Farm fresh eggs, $5 a dozen. Now, if you haven't bought eggs for some time at the market, $5 is not a bad price. And it says there, fresh farm eggs from happy chickens. Isn't that something? And cage free. That's a big deal. Cage free, whether it's chickens or animals today, a lot of young people have concern and really uh, have interest in this type of thing. And so the farm markets have become a, a, a not only a place where you can get a produce that's, uh, I would say, more fresh. Uh, many times you can get better prices for the produce. 91% of the time the prices are of lower cost uh, on the farm market. But it's a social event. You know, this happens to be in Bellingham, Washington, where they got musicians, you got face painters, you got foods from all ethnicities. And so it's a fun event. And so it's a whole collage, whole variety of colors. I never thought. 50 years ago at Cornell that I would see tomatoes of so many different colors. They've even brought the wrinkles back into tomatoes with the heirlooms. You know, we spent 100 years in academia to take the wrinkles out. They're back in again. Anyway, so anyway, it's high touch. And I want to see, see the young lady way in the back. That, that's Gretchen. I want to introduce you to Gretchen. She has a farm called Spring Frog Farm. 
And she grows a number of heirlooms, but one of the things I'm finding out with a lot of the young people, they come from the city, they have no idea how to, how to grow agricultural crops. And so they are struggling, and I think the future for the land grant mission is more than just GMOs, genetically modified cropping systems, but we gotta get back to the basics, working with these young people as our future producers of vitamins and minerals. How has the farm market thing grown? In 1994, roughly 1,700. We're up close to 8,000 markets now in the cities. I think all of you have probably been to a farm market. And just in the last six months, well, from January to July, the increase in farm markets has been nearly 10%. So it's growing very, very rapidly. So I wanna go now to specialty markets that are farmer owned. And um, you know, when I was working with Disney, I, I really felt, and then going to school at Rutgers University and, and seeing the mini markets there, I could really see that people wanted to not only meet the grower, but to see the product growing. And so I did a, a quick design with an artist rendering uh, called Jensen Farms, or just fresh from the farm, where the, where the public could come in and buy the product, and at the same time, see the product growing. You know, it's a funny thing. I learned very early on at farm markets in New Jersey, they may have only 12 corn plants growing outside the market. And you would go into the market and ask the person, where's that product coming from? And you'd be looking at the tomatoes and everything. Oh, right outside the door. You know, those city folks would see those 12 plants and believe it. You know, we call it eyewash in the Disney business. And so the whole thing is perception and freshness and all of that. So I felt it important for the, for, for the public to get an experience with that. We're gonna to go to Hopkinton, Massachusetts, the Water Fresh Farms there. They have just opened up a farm market. Hopkinton's where they start the Boston Marathon. And I tell most of my students and most of my people, be sure that you build the farms where there's money. We love getting money out of those city, city folks' pockets for freshness and good taste. And so Water Fresh Farms came into being and they, they, uh, they have a, n a number of things to select from from a number of different lines of food, but they also have the offering of fresh vegetables. And then you can go out through a set of double doors right into the greenhouse, be on sort of a deck and overlook the vegetables and see the crops growing. It's a big deal, when, especially when there's two foot of snow on the ground in the winter and they're going out there with a cup of cappuccino and we put the fans on the other side of the basil so the smells of the basil flows in. It works, folks. It works, it brings them in. So then we're gonna go all the way back across the country to Whatcom County in Washington State, Bellwood Acres. And um, they also, rather than growing vegetables, they grow apples of all varieties and cultivars. And they, make, they put apples in candies, they put it into pies and pastries and so forth. But they have a lot of windfall uh, apples and they uh, make that into juice and distill that into vodka. But I want to introduce you to the five senses, the sight, the hearing, the smell, taste, touch. Those are things that I became very acquainted with with the Disney people. If you're going through the energy pavilion, when you first go in that pavilion at Epcot, you see the dinosaurs, you get the musty smell, you see the vapor in the air, you feel like you're in the rainforest of three million years ago. Anyway, that works, and it works very well. And at the end of my talk, I'll show you how we're bringing the, the sound of the farm back to the city. But anyway, this is a way for your customers not only to, to get good fresh foods, but it's a way to talk to your customers where you as the farmer can explain, give tours, and it's the high touch part that I think we're gonna do a lot more of in our agriculture in the future. I think all of you have heard of Harry and David uh, in Medford, Oregon. They have catalogs, they have tropical fruits, 12 months of the year, other kinds of fruits, fruits of the month, and so forth. And you know, a lot of these places, they're built with a, like a fancy barn or what you would envision on, on a farm. You know, I was just to Wilson Farms in um, Livingston, or a, a town in, in, uh, New, Mass in New Hampshire, I think it is, or Massachusetts, and I counted the cars there, 150 cars parked there. Six cash registers just working full time. Uh, with people there, and what we do there is put the old cars out in front. We want nostalgia to be part of the whole thing of sight, 
bringing you back to the good old days when we used to experience the farm, all of us at the grandfathers or your, or your parents. But you see what they have there, this Harry and David from the garden to, our t to your table, Harry and David's own local vegetables, over 40, 40 varieties grown over, over two acres, garden located in meadow, or, and so on. But you can see their presentation where they uh, have the, uh, the, uh, the, the uh, bushel baskets there on the left with the burlap bags, earth colors, lots of signage, lots of lights to really bring, make those vegetable displays pop at you, pop up at you as you go through. And then they have uh, flat, flat, flat plate screens where they show how they do their packaging for gifts and, and, and then really, really how they go out and harvest the pears and the apples and so forth. <coughs> Putting people in touch with their product that they buy, portraying the freshness that they have in their product. Going to supermarkets, and that is, how do we bring the farm into the supermarkets? And they're working hard to do that. I have an acquaintance that I went to school with who is the owner of uh, Ocean Mist Farms. You'll see their product in every <coughs> store in America. And, you know, you have to realize that there are some really big operations in the world. For example, I asked the owner one day, I said, how many cartons of lettuce did you produce last week? You know, thinking of my small grower. And he says, 87,000. But, you know, they face a challenge. And their challenge is to take that truck on the lower left all the way to New York from Watsonsville, California. And that's nine to $10,000 a truck and it really destroys your profit margin. So they're coming up ways uh, of, uh, uh, of having what we call social media. It's a good way of social media. I think social media for a lot of young people has made them antisocial. And that's why we're going to the farm markets. They sold to get out there and socialize. It's a great social event. But what you see now, these vegetable companies, Ocean Mist and Eurofresh Farms, they're passing out recipes and, div and, and and so it is saying, you buy our product, this is what you can do with that. And so they will end up with thousands of people, whether it be Facebook or Twitter or whatever, uh, contacting people to look for their products in the stores. And that's their way of trying to introduce the high touch to the consumer. The farm market, look, these are big farm markets. Uh, one is in Seattle, one is in uh, Arizona, another one in, in uh, Washington, another one in northern Washington. But what they're doing is that they're bringing the pallets in. They're bringing the, the high light systems. The signage almost looks like it's handwritten, even though it's put with a computer. Uh, you'll see the wooden baskets. You'll see the boxes. You'll see all the portrayal. And it's almost like a, a floral operation, but done with vegetables. They'll have their waterfall effect, where the vegetables will be flowing in, in over the top. You know, a lot of those bushel baskets, they, they look overflowing, but there's newspaper in the bottom and just put the stuff on the top, see? It all works. It all works very well, but you've got to have people attending that. And some of these markets, they'll have three or four people full-time just keeping that, those baskets full. Uh, really local. I mean, this is a store up there in Anacortes in Bellingham, Washington, where they really emphasize local growing. And so they will have the signage up there that I know many of those farmers in that area, less than 35 miles. Now that's really fresh, but USDA standards say that anything within 400 miles or within the state is qualified for local. But they really want local, local, 35 miles to this site. Now I know some of them are 70 miles, you want to be explicit about it, but anyway, that's the message. Uh, now you see that fellow in the back there, he's kind of giving me a hard look. And, uh, and I'm sitting there with my camera just flashing away, getting ready for this program. And he said, you know, you can't take any photos. And I thought for a minute and I said, well, I could see headlines. University of Arizona professor arrested for taking photos in the market. I just kept taking photos. And anyway, he came to me, well, take photos when none of my people are looking. Anyway, so anyway, it's a, they know it's a big thing. They know that this local, portraying local, is a big thing for their future. So it's not only real local, but you can get a little taste of Washington State. You can get organic. Now, we know organic is a craze that's coming, and I work with organic growers. We're putting digesters in back of supermarkets, taking all the wet waste. It's between 1,000 
to 2,000 pounds a day, and putting that into a liquid in 24 hours that's Armory approved for organics. And so we're doing work now with drip irrigation to get that through and so forth. We see a, a big future with that. But anyway, not only do you have the signage in the supermarkets, but you have the owner and their chefs portraying how to use their product. Now, I stand there and watch the people. They really don't pay a lot of attention to what the guys say, but they feel good. I feel, and I talk to them. I said, do you like, oh yeah, we like that a lot. Do you like this produce that's freshly harvested? Oh, it's addictive, they'll tell me. And so, you know, it's, it's a lot of things. I used to work with a company called Nature Sweet, the little cherub tomatoes you see in the markets. I used to wear the, their shirts when I go down to Mexico and work with them. And people would stop me in Dallas, Fort Worth and say, are you the person that grows those tomatoes? And I'd say, well, I help out. Well, they ha well I, I, I have to tell you that we uh, have to tell our kids they can't have any more until they finish their dinner. See, that's what we like in the veggie market. You know, we say M&Ms, eat your heart out. We got real vitamins and minerals coming to you in the future. Introduce you to the McPhails. It's a family. They started about five years ago and growing greenhouse crops in north of Bellingham, Washington. And uh, it's a small grower. Uh, you see Brenda there on the, on the left, lower left. She's now uh, seven years older. But she's, this is Hagen's Markets. They're selling their product in the store for $3.99. I've seen greenhouse growing coming in from Canada no more than 10, 15 miles away, selling for $1.79, and they're still selling as much. Why? Local. It's done local. And what they do with their tomatoes, they, they, they're out there, and they're out there with, uh, there's Brenna yeah, doing taste trials, people coming by and tasting them. And when they deliver their tomatoes, they have 15 stores that they deliver to, and the owner would deliver them, or his wife, or a family matter. It's the high touch part. Going up to Charlie, say, how's it going today in the produce? And she talked talk to them. And there's a relationship formed there. I can tell you, within a matter of weeks, by doing that, their product is moving to the front of the store, and the Canadian stuff is in the back, you see. And so the pricing is good. The high touch is there. It makes a huge difference. I've seen it throughout this country happening. Another family in Arizona, they produce the, the microgreens, a big thing, you know. We're gonna start putting this garnish on our steaks and our open face sandwiches. I'm from Danish ancestry, and we've been doing open face sandwiches for years with these teeny weeny greenies on top. Anyway, so that's a specialty markets. We see families getting in where they have 50 different kinds. We have a seed company called Johnny's. If you haven't met Johnny's, you just go Google them. A tremendous company in Maine that's making a huge difference with all the small growers getting into the business. And so uh, I visit them about once a year, and they work with 450 different breeders throughout the world, adding new products to their catalog, testing them there on site at their farm in Maine. Gotham Greens, you probably heard about Gotham Greens. You can Google that. Uh, they had a five-page spread, five full pages in Time Magazine last week. It was called Local Produce Growing Up. And there they talk about the explosion of farm markets in this country and uh, what is happening with the young people, them going into this kind of work. But she has a quarter acre, and I, I won't tell you the cost of doing that because it, there was a tremendous amount of zoning effort, so forth and so forth, but now the zoning has been redone so that this can become commonplace. But she has a quarter acre up there, and in that quarter acre she will produce 110 tons of lettuce per year. She will get rough, oh, I'm not, I'm not supposed to tell you what she gets a pound, but four ounces sells for $3.99, gives you an idea. Whole Foods will take most of it, and they will call on the Monday morning after a weekend, they say, when are your trucks going to get here to pick up the lettuce? Oh, we can't get there till this, oh, no, we can't wait till this afternoon. We're coming right now to pick it up. And that hasn't been just the last few months. It's been a, quite a few months ago, that, well, a couple years since they started. But anyway, local is a big thing. It allows small growers getting out of academia to learn the high tech and how to take that high tech to the general public in a very high touch way. And I see a lot of the big companies that deal with the public are gonna try to learn from this in their own way, do the high touch. Gotham Greens is a New York-based company dedicated to the growing of highest quality vegetables, culinary herbs, 
Anyway, it's uh, pesticide freight. They have the solar collectors and so forth on the roof. Sustainability is their big word nowadays in America. But University of Arizona, just to pitch, our growth in students coming into this field is really dramatic. And um, uh, we're the only university in the, in, the, in the United States that works with young people to bring them into this brand new technology of, uh, uh, and, and working with them on local production. And they go out to the, uh, to, to the they work not only in big greenhouses for the, for the bigger greenhouses, but also many of them get into the business. We know what fresh vegetables and smells and humidity and light will do. We produce two salads a day for 85 people uh, that overwinter uh, at the South Pole. They had tremendous mental problems years ago. And, uh, and now with, 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 with the lights and the smells and the freshness, they have almost eliminated all the mental problems of people stationed there, closed under closure for eight months. It's been sort of a mirror image for us as we develop with NASA the lunar base systems of food production. We know in this tube right here, we can produce 50% of the oxygen just from plants for an astronaut. And we know that those plants will, in that astronaut will produce enough CO2 and the bugs that break down the waste, of not only human waste, plant waste, will release oxygen. And it's sort of a carbon oxygen balance. So we're taking this science into outer space we worked with Mark, with, with, uh, with the government, with USD or, or uh, NASA. And uh, it's an exciting program for our kids to get into. And uh, like I say, uh, we like to know the produce people. It's the high touch part. We like happy customers. And we like, and years ago, I did this with Ellen Wong. Uh, we did that with one of my growers back in Hawaii, where he showed what you could do with veggies from a greenhouse and he, how you can really dress that up for the, for, for the palate of, of Americans and how you can make salads really, really dance in the future. So that's my, my talk. And I, I kind of wanted to have you just a little bit, uh, bring you a little bit to the sounds of the country to the city. I'll just do it once. One other thing I need to say is that we, we normally do workshops on controlled environment agriculture in April, but we've had such a demand of young people, we're gonna do an earlier one in early January. So if your company or you have people you know that wanna be involved with that, I'll have these up here for your taking. And if you wanna to talk to me more, more about it, I'll be happy to do so. <laughs>